Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for asking me here. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. John Marks. I'm a fellow of the Royal College of Scratches, England, and uh, the Royal College of Scratches of New Zealand. Um, uh, excuse me, can you start again? There's a whole bunch of people coming. Sorry. Uh, and uh, in the 80s, uh, uh, my practice became well known for uh, prescribing and control drugs to patients. And I went to New Zealand uh, pursuing a similar policy because everybody was surprised by the results. I'm now retired from New Zealand. And back in Vienna with uh, I want to uh, share with you uh, the fruits of uh, a very strange consequence of prohibition. There's a saying in uh, English that the path to hell is paved with good intentions. There's no doubt that uh, the prohibition of alcohol and then of drugs was founded upon good intentions. But many argue now that this has truly led to hell. Twenty years ago, Richard Stevenson estimated the economic costs of the drug prohibition imposed upon British society. He arrived at a conservative estimate of two thousand million pounds per year, ungefähr drei milliard, milliard euro. That could probably have been doubled even then. And certainly the costs have accelerated every year since. These costs of drug-related crime, its detection, legal process, custody, took no account of changed behaviour such as the burglar alarm industry, nor the rocketing price of insurance premiums. This securing of property also drove the target of inquisitive crime to offences against the person to obtain cash for drugs, which explains the wells of aid public fear of violent crime, especially in our cities where the sense of safety and community is being destroyed. Well, these are some of the costs that Stevenson estimated. How is this cost of fear to be measured? Politicians indulge in foolish Dutch auctions to see who can be tougher on drugs. But the corruption of police, judges, politicians and government are all inestimable public costs. Despite half a century of prohibition, the number of drug takers has risen by an order of magnitude, so that larger and larger fractions of the population become cavalier with respect to the rule of law and undermining the rule of law is a priceless loss that has taken Europe two millennia to restore since the fall of Rome and Byzantium. Puzzlingly, Western governments, familiar with market forces, seem to believe they can buck the market when it comes to drugs. As Aldous Huxley noted, humanity at large will probably never be able to dispense with artificial paradises. Most men and women need lives at best, at worst so painful, at best so boring. But to transcend oneself has always been one of the principal appetites of the soul. So there will always be a demand for some alteration of mental state. And you'd be hard put to find a society anywhere in the world, or indeed anywhere in history, that has not used a drug in this way. 
with many researchers that have demonstrated that this desire, this fourth basic uh, uh, drive, is even found in animals, mm -hmm. some animals. And to satisfy this demand, Russell Newcomb quoted the Ed Governor of Edinburgh Jail, where's an influx of out and outflow of people, no system, however secure, can prevent drugs entering the institution. But if you can't prevent drugs entering a totalitarian institute, like a totalitarian society, like a jail, what hope of you uh, uh, banning them in a whole national society? <clears throat> At the beginning of the 1980s, I gave up my research into EEGs, electroencephalograms, brain waves, in Liverpool, and took up an NHS consultancy uh, in uh, this town here, which is, and I compared it with the one up there. Uh, <clears throat> From my predecessor in witness, I inherited a rather symphony <coughs> where controlled drugs such as heroin and cocaine were prescribed to addicts and a whole variety of other drugs. Uh, British law hadn't followed the American prohibition and it, uh, uh, retained an exception to that rule for doctors prescribing to addicts. The government had become concerned about drug misuse and HIV infection and asked all clinics to audit their policies to see what worked. And much to our surprise we found the following. First of all, <coughs> Yeah. Or if, it is, if anybody has a pointer. Yeah. Uh, well, in the middle row, uh, you'll see that uh, the middle row, uh, the deaths uh, fell to zero. Nobody died uh, under our management, whereas under the usual clinics in Bootle, north of Liverpool, there was no such prescribing clinic, and 16 percent over a decade died. And all these would be uh, uh, young men and women in their uh, uh, prime of life, usually. Every one of them, somebody's son or daughter. Then uh, the police followed uh, our patients for a year and were uh, uh, astounded by the disappearance of the street dealer from the uh, uh, town square and witness and other places and the acquisitive crime amongst the individuals concerned dropped you could see from that uh, something like uh, 14 fold uh, which uh, <coughs> is an extraordinary drop and uh, uh, however we could explain those two uh, to a degree um, Clean drugs, however badly you think of drugs, uh, must be a, a adult, better than adulterated, impure substances uh, taken in uh, insanitary circumstances, secretly, and that's the reason for the zero. And of course, if you're going to commit crime and can get your drugs lawfully, you're probably not going to want to commit crime and risk jail. However, the first row was the uh, surprising one, and I expected that one of the problems was giving drugs out to addicts, it might increase the rate of addiction. But as you see uh, there, in Bootle, while there was no clinic, there was over 200 new notifications of addiction, uh, 100,000 operations per year. And in Witness, uh, roughly uh, uh, 12th of that, less than a 12th of that, even though drugs were being prescribed 
So uh, that of course <laughs> up short, and then we noticed that uh, in Edinburgh, where they had closed down their Ralston clinic uh, about a year or two beforehand, uh, and to different degrees had done the same in other cities in the UK, uh, led to a dramatic range of uh, uh, HIV infection, AIDS. Whereas in Mersey, which was a seaport that traded with Africa and South America and lots of prostitution and drug taking, the rate was zero. Um, now, you'll see that the Ralston clinics operating during the 50s and beforehand led to a, an almost uh, uh, negligible rate of addiction in the UK. Uh, and in America, of course, there was the years of reefer madness and rocketing increase in drug use under their fairly severely enforced prohibition. By 1960, transatlantic travel made the uh, uh, British system accessible to Americans. We've got lots of refugees, and a sudden rise in the notification of addiction. And then um, uh, the uh, Instead of your ordinary family doctor, Algemeinärzte, prescribing for you, as had always been done before, they set up clinics run by psychiatrists in the 60s to cope with this new influx and carried on prescribing in the same way, one of which I inherited in witness. And that, as you see, stopped the rise and the uh, level um, from going up steeply leveled up. <laughs> And then what happened here is that most psychiatrists, uh, psychiatrists have always worried about being proper doctors, and this suggested they weren't even being proper psychiatrists, handing out drug clinics, sweeties, and decided the proper treatment is to get folk off all these drugs and stop them. Uh, a few, just historically, almost by accident, uh, survived in the old system, which is where I was. I was holding the baby when the uh, change of policy came around. But it, the objective uh, yardsticks of measuring its effects showed something very strange was going on that shouldn't be ignored. Uh, in fact, if you look at um, the way in which alcohol and other drugs have been uh, uh, controlled, you've got roughly eight experiments here, uh, free availability of alcohol and drugs before 1870, which is why it said that the fastest way out of Manchester was a bottle of gin. Uh, then uh, between 1820 and 1960, England rationing alcohol with licensing hours and special practices <coughs> called pubs and so on. And actually, uh, the other drugs are rationed from 1870 to 1960 via doctors. Uh, you'll see that uh, uh, since 1960, uh, the UK has diverged alcohol, that has been heavily promoted, and the drugs has been heavily prohibited. So, uh, uh, there's a big contrast there and there with alcohol and the other drugs. You see uh, two further experiments in America. Uh, the alcohol prohibition that they ran for 10 years, and that uh, the drug prohibition has now been going for about 70 years. So you've got uh, eight experiments, and uh, you can see at the top the number of folk in each sample, 62 million and 240 million. Uh, should give us pretty robust statistics. And what happens is that you get a graph like this. I've added for New Zealand audiences because uh, they love their coffee in New Zealand. Uh, coffee in 1990. And coffee in Berlin when Frederick the Great okay. employed his um, cafe schnitzel and tried to forbid coffee. Uh, but the interesting thing to see is that whatever the drug, whatever the society, um, uh, things yo-yo to and fro 
along what looks like a parabola. Uh, Dutch cannabis consumption has mostly fallen uh, from 1985 to 1990 when they introduced, over the years they introduced the coffee shops and loosened up. And you see that uh, uh, Russian alcohol policy, and I'm sorry, uh, colors might not be as clear as they could be, uh, used to be in uh, 1960, uh, I mean, all Russians are drunk, uh, drinking far too much. And uh, 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 I think it was Gorbachev decided to tighten up. And uh, Russian policy came over here in 1985. And they were <coughs> quickly distilling their own, and the black market flourished. And Gorbachev was nothing if not pragmatic, and uh, he slackened off fairly quickly. Uh, so the Russian consumption is uh, uh, much reduced from either of those prior circumstances. I note in particular that the abscissa is the lawful supply, not any old supply, but the supply allowed by law. And this is a graph of the lawful supply against the demand for drugs. And we've seen that supply and demand are not suppressible, even though Western governments are trying to do so. Now, uh, these eight experiments uh, with an average duration of over half a century, mean these huge shifts in the number of people taking drugs in such huge numbers about as like, are about as likely to have arisen by chance as one chance in 10 with 18 zeros after it. Far less than your likelihood of winning the lottery. In other words, this didn't happen by chance. It was due to policy. It was due to enormous promotion of drugs like alcohol and enormous suppression of drugs like cannabis. And this effect upon uh, the independent variable, the lawful supply, is what's given rise to the huge variation in the dependent variable the consequent social demand. <coughs> However, most people thought that suppressing the lawful supply would follow the dotted line here to zero. In other words, that the supply-demand curve was exponential and not quadratic. Now you can see how the huge consumption and epidemic intoxication arises with, with uh, brewers and all the rest of promoting drink more of our stuff. What's more difficult to understand is why the left limb of the parabola goes up uh, rather than going to zero when the lawful supply is decreased to zero. So, it's clear that, quite empirically, we found a happy medium between epidemic intoxication promoted by the brewers and the black markets peddled by the gangsters. It is of note that this is a graph of lawful supply against consequent demand. If the state so restricts the lawful supply that it reduces it to zero, it does not get rid of the supply. Simply abdicates it to gangsters. How does this counterintuitive idea work? If you have a one gram heroin habit in Liverpool, what you have to do is to buy five grams and then take your gram out, adulterate the remaining four so they're made up to five, and then sell them on, and you pay for your one gram. So you have to adulterate 
the drug with, you know, something suitable in colour, like brick dust or very good for the body, brick dust intravenously. Uh, and then you've got to recruit five new users. And it's said that insurance companies would love to have salesmen as devoted as addicts. And this pyramid selling scheme is the reason that drug taking peddled in this way is so damaging. In fact, if you deliberately contrived so to do, it would be difficult to describe a more socially destructive, more individually criminalizing, more unhealthy, more efficient way of making drugs available than we do now under the prohibition. The great fallacy of Western prohibition is that it produces control. In fact, it does the opposite. It produces chaos. Because the supply and demand curve is quadratic. Not exponential. Or we just see the mechanism that produces that. And consequently, policies based on that produce these consequences. Advertising promotes it, we see that with alcohol. Prohibition peddles it, we see that with drugs. Only regulation controls consumption. And there's been some half hearted attempts at that. In uh, Britain, uh, before the 60s, control drugs like heroin and cocaine. Uh, we're in that third category and not a problem. I support the legalization and regulation of drugs, not just because it would improve the health and save the lives of many addicts, but also because it would remove them from crime and destroy the criminal power that drug cartels have become. Prohibitionists have consistently failed to accept their responsibility for the horrors generated by the prohibition. They also fail to recognize their assault on the freedom of adults to lead their own lives in whatever direction, including foolish ones, that they choose. Fortunately, I think we're relearning these important lessons. But governments move so slowly, it seems many more adolescents will die and policemen be shot before the prohibition is ended. But I think we are waking from the nightmare. The argument is on our side. The gravity of the drug prohibition, like that of the alcohol prohibition before it, is that in denying civil freedoms to some citizens, such as that of drug takers to explore their own neurochemistries. We therefore je jeopardize all our freedoms. The result is what Sass, Thomas Sass, called the therapeutic tyranny or dictatorship by doctors or politicians using medical terms or metaphors. We will stop you smoking or drinking, or sniffing, for your own good. No tyranny is so great as that exercised, ostensibly for the good of its victims. It was exactly the justification of the Spanish Inquisition. We're doing this for the good of your immortal soul. Well, it all reminds me of Thomas Jefferson's warning, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Or even Franklin's more bitter observation, those who would surrender essential liberty deserve a liberty or safety. 
Actually, that's a bit truncated. The saying of Franklin is, those who would surrender essential liberty for a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Take any questions or cries you have on the history or even the argument. <laughs>